Hello folks, you're all very welcome back to the Celtic Soul Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and for listening to us over the past couple of years. And today on the show, I will be joined by Frank Trundle. The Frank Trundle may not be known to many, but his his life story is quite unique. And I've been trying to get Frank on the podcast for a number of years now. And he always said he'd come on when he retired. And he has now retired because I'm seeing a lot more of him at Celtic Park where he sits close to me in the stadium and I always always have great chats with Frank so it's great to have him on the podcast Frank Trundle thank you so much for coming into the studio uh, you're very welcome to the Celtic Soul Podcast thanks very much glad to be here thank you glad to be here <clears throat> good stuff Frank if you could just bring that mic a bit closer to you that's good stuff okay Frank uh, well, we start with you, uh, the quiet man that goes to see Celtic with us, a member of St. Margaret's Celtic Supporters Club, uh, the opposite to Hilly, who sits at the table with us in Celtic Park. He's another quiet guy, but not as quiet as you. Frank, um, I, have you been enjoying this season so far? Because last year you were the level head among us all when everything was going tits up around us. You kept the head cool and said, look, we'll be back and under Andrew Postacoglu. I think maybe we got back quicker than we thought we would. <coughs> True, yeah, I think so. Um, people uh, questioned the, the, the actual uh, Ange when he first came, but um, I, I've always a policy, forget about social media and whatever and all the hype that goes with it. Uh, just give the guy a chance or anybody who puts the top on, give them a chance. I said not everybody understands the pressure of having to win every game at Celtic or the history as such, but they learn, they have to learn quick enough. And I suppose he brought in so many new players as well. True, yeah. And some quality players, you know, some nice technically gifted players as well. You know, so, and it also introduced a lot of pace to the team as well, So, which was something probably was lacking at times, you know. And a great work rate. Great work rate, yeah. Great, but, you know, in general now, I was lucky enough to be, to go to the World Cup in, um, in Japan in 2002 and experience what it was like over there. We were there for, what, two, three weeks or such, you know. With two weeks in Japan and a week in Korea, and the people in general are just first class. Recommend anybody if you have, get a chance, go there, just experience it. They're so genuine and hardworking, as such. And also, the place was absolutely spotless. You wouldn't get a postage stamp on the ground. Yeah, and Baz, one of my best pals, he he lived over there for many years, and he just goes, he says the wood over there is respect. Yeah, ultra. It, they learn it from the womb. Simple as that. And I think that's why people, when they grow older. They're looked after. They're not discarded as such. Family looks after them. They grow and they look after the family during their course of their adolescence and their growth. And, but they're always looked after then and, and the, you know, at the end of the day. And hopefully not, uh, you won't get too much, um, I said, um, influence from the West to change that. Yeah, I suppose this, uh, our, first, our first introduction to a Japanese player at Sally Park was Shinsuke Nakamura, oh, yeah. who was absolutely outstanding, yeah. probably... Gordon Strachan's best signing mm-hmm. true gifted player you know you got the ball I mean I remember the, the goal he scored against I remember against, against Rangers it was 25 yards something flying. what a goal yeah, yeah. got a goal I mean it went in I remember it was in the north stand at the time and I saw it you could see it all the way the, the whole stadium just lifted before it hit the net because you knew it was, in the, it was going to end up in the back of the net but yeah he was gifted and that was the first time we saw the kind of influx of, of Japanese mm-hmm. tourists uh, the first time we saw the Japanese flag and sailors outside Celtic yeah. Park yeah. and then we've had a I suppose it's gone full circle now with the, the arrival of Ange from the Japanese league where he won and then the arrival forced of Kyogo who has been a sensation mm-hmm. true and hopefully now um, <coughs> Celtic next season he'll come on another level because after all they came from actually finishing a season in Japan then travelling back and forward for their, their uh, internationals and then to have to play most games with Celtic, with the exception of being injured, like we we'll see the best of them next year. And has any other players stood out for you this year apart from Kyogo? Uh, I like actually I like most of the signings at the moment. Carter Vickers, um, then you've got um, Abada and uh, uh, Riley. I think they've all contributed. I mean, at the end of the day, Callum McGregor was the driving force. The guy hardly put a foot wrong. At least that's my opinion, anyway. You know, so, but no, I say most all the to go from what twelve players was. You know, and um, practically a new team and, and I was willing you know saying like this is transition you know hoping for the best but then we when we won the league cup and in the end of the day you know, we were knocked out of the, the cup 
because we didn't really turn up on that day but for whatever reason. You know, it wasn't our usual. We wouldn't play our usual intense game. I think if we played like we when we beat them three 0 it would have been all over in the first half. Like last weekend, it was, should have been over in the first half as well. You know, to take it with you, but. I remember saying me prior to uh, <coughs> the St. Johnson game, I said, somebody is due a hiding. And I remember the last time I said that was, um, I met a guy, I was coming back from Spain, and I met a guy, and I can't remember his name, but he had he had done the walk to paradise from Sligo, to Buddha, you know, in, in honour of Brother Walford. Is that going to say? In honour of Brother Walford. And I was talking to him, and we were chatting about, you know, the, the, ch- the chances we missed. And I said, look, Somebody's going to get a hiding. And I think it was actually St. John's, and I'm not sure. When I came back the following week, it was about six or seven nil. You know, so, like, if we converted every chance, we're, we are, we're creating enough chances to win every game comfortably in the first half. And next year, I say, uh, you'll see the best of them. And you'll be back over on Saturday. Yes, 10 to 7 flight. When we take on hard to, I spoke to Matt McGlown earlier in the week on the podcast, and you know, Matt is of the opinion that when they came to Celtic Park, we dominated them each time this season. They are toured, so they're the, they're the next best. Yeah. Um, they, they they won't be afraid to put in a few tackles <coughs> because um, there's people in that um, dugout who would be no friends to Celtic. And it could it, it could be a tough afternoon for us, but a tough lunchtime for us. But I think, if Frank, if we get off to a good start and start creating chances... You know, mm. well, it's like I've, I always believe that um, teams get a hit; they get a free hit on Celtic players because some of the early tackles mm. go in that justify a, a yellow card. They get away with, so that gives them confidence. Maybe I'll hit them again because you're not. He goes the Celtic player goes by him. The guy's not going to let him happen the second time. He'll take him out. And refs have got to watch this and be more, you know, in control of the game and not let the players such control it. But it's um. I look. I think we win. It be, might be close. Then again, it could very well be hammering. You know, it could very well hammering. But look, the important thing is we play our game. We win the game. Yeah, and that's it. And you know, it is what it is. After that, you know. And we are happy on Sunday with 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 the when we finished up that we were still six points clear. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. I mean, it could have been three. It could have been six. It could have been nine. You yeah. know what I mean? In the end. But the thing is, uh, to be honest, with you, I don't enjoy um, old firm games, or for, I don't want to use the word for old firm. I don't enjoy Rangers and Sefco games. Let me put it that way. It's a stress. I just, it's the week beforehand. You're thinking about it. I try not to. The day of the game, you always, you know, think the worst for whatever reason, and uh, I just don't enjoy those games. Well, if a three nil up at half time, I'll enjoy it. Might lead to say, you know, but <laughs> uh, <coughs> it is what it is. You know, so I just, um, hopefully, now. We get like we're assuming that Rangers are not going to drop any points in their next three games. You know, we could it could be if we win on thing. We could be all, on on. Uh, it's over technically anyway. Uh, well, in to be realistic, it's over if we win on on, on Saturday. We, and providing this, this, the other three teams are not going to lay down and get beaten six nil or each each. You know, it just it's happened before. It happens in the past, and it wasn't seven nil or something. They won. You know, jeez. Anyway, we're not really, look. Um, <laughs> See, Hearts have nothing read. Hearts are safe in third, and they have the cup final to look forward to. So that, that might maybe that might be on the back of their minds. Uh, we don't want to get any injuries, so we'll see how it goes. You know. Well, I'm going to take you back a bit further now, Frank, because I met you through Celtic um, when you joined our club. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew I knew you through a friend as well. Where does you know your Dublin man of Belfast stock? And I think there's a bit of mead stock in you there as well, mm. Frank. Just just take us back to you know your young days and you know how you how you started to follow Celtic. Well, it was my dad. He was from Belfast, and he followed Belfast Celtic. And naturally enough, after I'd be Celtic, and <clears throat> I remember uh, I must have been about ten or twelve or something. Like that. I'm seventy three now, so I was about ten or twelve. I think it was a bit of a cliff, Richard. But- sixty, sixty two, <laughs> around. I think it was about nine sixty two. And I remember asking my dad. He said, I said to him. Um, how long am I a Celtic supporter? And he said, you were a Celtic supporter in your mother's womb. I'll always remember saying that. And he used to sing the songs to us. Now, I have four brothers. One is Man U, one is Liverpool, one is West Ham, probably dropped on his head. And the other one it doesn't follow any, but has an interest in Celtic because he was the one we kind of was close enough to, you know, to growing up and we went out together and all that stuff, you know. And he doesn't follow anybody, but he, he would always kind of text me or WhatsApp me saying, oh, you had a good result today or whatever, you know, that type of thing. But three others, and you know something, none of them have ever left the country to see their team play. 
<laughs> unlike you. Unlike you. So they all thought I was mad and, you know, whatever. So, and also the politics will be on the other side of their thinking as well. So, but, um, no, it was, that was the time. And, and I remember it was my, an uncle of mine, Jimmy, who was in Coventry, lived in Coventry. I think he did a little bit of, I, I, at least I've, I don't know, I haven't proof of this, but I heard he did a bit of scouting and he wanted to bring me to the, the, the Lisbon 67 because he had tickets. And dad says, you're doing your exams. That was it. Like dad put, being from Belfast, he, the importance of, of, uh, of, uh, education was prime with him, you know? And that, but he brought, I he went, just go over in the boat, a young, whatever. And then actually, enough, when I started working, I was able to finance myself and, um, start still on the boat and used to go on my own. And I think, um, I went, uh, my nephew used to go and a few other friends. And then when you start flying, you, um, what do you call it? You, you know, it was, it was different. You know, but I used to, I met a few guys then. I tell you, so it, when it comes to, you know, we, we used the word family. With Celtic and people say, ah, family, this, you know, it's all that. Well, I'll give you an example. When I, when my wife passed away, it was sudden. The amount of people that turned up for both the removal and the, who I didn't know, all I knew was from nodding, you know, how are you at the game, knew some of them only by, by, um, nickname or first names. And individuals, individuals came, one guy came from Boston, another guy came from, two came from Scotland. I didn't even, I, all I knew them was from matches and sitting beside them or sitting in front of them in, in the North Stand at the time, you know. And they came and it just, you know, the comfort of that. And, you know, it, 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 it helped greatly because it was a shock. I mean, for two years after Brenda passed away, I used to suffer panic attacks. I used to, couldn't breathe. The first one was the worst because I thought I was having a heart attack. And after that, then I just couldn't manage them. But that was the effect of apparently just finding her asleep. What I thought was just asleep. It wasn't that she had, she had passed away a few hours earlier, you know? And, uh, but when you, when, when you talk about family, that is, you know, an example of what family is. Celtic players. And anybody that I've met, most of my friends are true Celtic. Um, they, they give you, and I have a good quality of life, as you know, Millish, you know, I have a, I can go do what I want when I, you know, when I want or whatever. I said, but the, the, between my son, who's in Australia and Celtic support, supporting Celtic and the people I met through them enhanced the quality of life I had. And I wouldn't have it if I didn't have Celtic because I remember, I, well, finished by saying, but one time I was down in Spain, you know where we are in Spain, you have a place in Spain as well. And I was sitting at the front watching the sea and this guy, and I had always had a Celtic color on me, whether it's a polo not, or a t-shirt or whatever, you know, and I was sitting down there with, with, um, my friend Anne, who you know as well, and she, um, we're sitting there. Next minute, this guy comes along and says, "What's the score? What's the score?" And we, I think we played hips that day or something. I think we won four nil or something like that. And I said, "We won." I said, "Oh, great, great." And we're chatting there. He was, he was from Coatbridge, and we we're chatting away there. And we're listening for an hour. We were, we were just yapping, and Anne is a big self supporter anyway, so it's not a problem. You know what I mean? To have somebody chatting to you, you know. But he, next minute, this girl comes over and she shouts, "Ma'am, I found him!" <laughs> and apparently she, he was over for a week with his daughters and the wife and three daughters and he said I had to just get away he said jeez he said it was too much female he said and they said look what they said I told you ma'am just look for somebody with a Celtic top on him and dad will sit beside him and that, like, that was it I mean he you know it, just we had a great old chat and um, he uh, went off then they dragged him off and that was it which kind of you know it broke up his day from you know? but that's what it is like you'll always get Celtic supporters always recognise each other you don't get that with Man U's or the Arsenal's or the Chelsea's. You don't get them. They'd probably end up fighting each other, you know. But we'll always um, uh, recognise each other. You know, whether it's come on the hoops, how you never good result, bad result, whatever, you know. Yeah, I'm always uh, I'm, I'm always happy to sit in your company, Frank, yeah. as well, and talk about Celtic because you always have good stories. Not just about Celtic, but yeah. about the whole, the more than 90 minutes of it. And um, which and you've been a great supporter of the fans, Ian, and I thank you. And any charity oh. stuff we do, you've always supported us. So I thank you on that as oh. well. But you told me one time you were wearing um, a Celtic top. You were flying to Australia, and you were in, lucky enough to be in the business class. And there was a bar on the plane, and you strolled up, and you said to me, "Once you wear a Celtic top, you'll get talking to someone." Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's, on, on the plane just got, it was on the it was the A three eighty. And there's a bar on, on the, at the end of it, you know, on the end of business class. I don't know whether it was on the other one. But at the end, just as you're going down to Lou. I was, actually, in fact, I was going down to Lou. I wasn't going down to the bar. And it was just a guy, come on the hoops, you know. And even the the staff, there was one of the uh, the actual stewards on the plane came over and chatted to me because he was a Barca fan. Right. And he had actually been at 
one of the games in Celtic Park when we played, we beat, remember we beat him 2 1 in the 125th anniversary. He was at that and he said he could never ever experience a, 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 what do you call it, um, an atmosphere such as. And he's been there back a few times since with his friends to bring them over for games that, you know, that we, you know, we just pick a game, come over for the weekend to, to uh, Glasgow. But things like, you know, you, you'll always get, you, there's a great reputation of Celtic supporters and it's true. Don't go away to wreck places. We go away, win, lose, or draw. You'll have a, you'll have a, you'll come home with a smile on your face. Yeah, well, I think Seville was, um, uh, yeah. I think Seville was proof of that. Mm. Uh, but I think um, the people of Seville, because we record this uh, close enough to uh, the Rangers playing in the semi-finals, second leg, and uh, I'd say the people in Seville are praying that they don't get through because if they've seen what they've done oh, in yeah, Manchester. Yeah, yeah. So it's, man, it's everywhere they go, and Gla- in, Bar- in Barca as well. They just got to see they're throwing people into the pond. You know, the, the, where the plastic, where the mural is for the to the freedom fighters, wasn't it? Yeah, plastic Catalonia, and they were doing it. You know, just and they laughing. That's all they are. They're zombies. You know, they they don't change. It's, you know, it's in their blood. You know, you see their comments they make. They're you know they're just vicious. You know, they're just pond scum. Sorry about that, but I have a few. Actually, I wouldn't mind. I have a few Rangers friends, believe it or not. They've never been to Ibrox and they won't go. They just inherited from their parents, you know. Yeah, and Frank, you, you mentioned there earlier on um, education. Your dad didn't wouldn't allow you to go to yeah. Lisbon because you were doing exams, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and education is very important. But you did get educated, but your the interest I have and I always have. I'm always annoying you about. Um, that's why I wanted you on the podcast because you've told me a few stories, but you wouldn't tell me any stories till you retired. Because you were obviously, um, I suppose it wouldn't it wouldn't be right and proper because you were um, to put the stories public until you mm. did retire, and but you were an educated person. You, you qualified. Um, what did you qualify as? As an engineer, electronics. An engineer, yeah. but how does an engineer? Now, if anyone knows Frank, Frank is not the biggest man in the world. Um, He's a gentleman. He's softly spoken. So how does a softly spoken Dublin well-educated engineer become a bodyguard and a train killer? <laughs> train killer. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I get arrested on the way back. Hopefully then Saturn will lose me. Um, uh, well, what happened was I got laid off. And at the time, my late wife, Brenda, she was working with Aer Lingus. And so we had one income coming in, which was okay. And I had a few bob then from the, from being laid off. So it wasn't an immediate type of uh, panic situation, right? And I always had, um, uh, an interest in science. And I was thinking, well, maybe I'll go back to college and, you know, do a degree in forensic science or something like that, you know? And, um, but like, we had Neil, he was in school. He was, um, uh, we had the one income which took care of the mortgage at the time and a few others, you know, but it was, it wasn't going to last, you know. So I decided, like a friend of mine had, had, did security, had a company at the time and he, um, looked after certain individuals and I trained with him at the time. We trained together and he said, would you be interested in doing it? And I said, no, I just, I wouldn't want to. Sorry, friend, what were you, what were you training now? I was, at, I was at the time I was a keto, but it was mixture. Uh, then I did a mixture with him, which is now MMA. And like it before it became what it is to this day, you know, it was just it, it, boxing and kickboxing or whatever, but it was mostly just to keep fit. And he said, look, I have a few clients, he said, and uh, I think, you know, you, you might be interested. So I said, look, I'll give it a try because at this stage now, you know, the money was, you know, you, you know yourself, if nothing's coming in, stuff you have is going out twice as quick, you know? So anyway, I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And the f- he, so he gave me, made a call to me and he said, the first uh, individual was, he rang me, he said, Frank, would you meet me out in Fox Rock, Westminster Road in Fox Rock? And I said, fair enough. I went out into the house and I said, and I hadn't, and I hadn't a clue who it was. Went in and the first thing I saw was, I think it was the King James Bible on the counter. And I said, a big one. So I know who this is. And at the time, uh, Jerry Lee was <coughs> reported to be in the country with his wife and his family and such. And he had, um, <coughs> he had a, Apparently, had brought security with him, but they didn't didn't work out for whatever reason, and they were sent home. So I was asked if I would look after him, and I said, "Look, you know," I said, "Okay, I'll have a look and have a chat to him." And talking to Jerry at the time wasn't you know possible because he wasn't in the best. But um, <coughs> they asked me, so I said, "Look." Eventually, what they said was, I, "I said I'll go away and think about it." And that day, I got a call, you know, saying I was introduced to him, saying that this is Frankie's going to look after you, and I hadn't read anything as such. But then that day, I um, got a call from Ferguson. He said to me, Frank, uh, could you, would you take Jerry to, to Mexico? 
Mexico City to uh, open the Hard Rock Cafe. And I said, okay, all right, fair enough, I'll do it. And then I realized <coughs> my passport was out of date and I was going to Mexico in two days. Yeah. So I luckily, down to the cop shop, got the forms, got the photographs, got them signed and into what was Molesworth Street at the time. I don't think you can use that place anymore. And I got it all done in a day, you know, because somebody knew somebody. So, and that was it. <coughs> it doesn't work that way nowadays. So I went to, um, to Mexico with him. Uh, we went free. I think it was Heathrow, then on to Atlanta, and then on to Mexico City. And uh, <coughs> I remember us booking into this hotel, a beautiful hotel. And uh, and the first thing I noticed was a lot of armed guards. And I said, Jesus, you know, are you in Cartelville, you know what I mean? So, <coughs> you know, and I said, but it turned out that the actual um, uh, Chinese premier was staying there for some reason. And he, um, he had taken over the top floor. And so, and one of the cases I went up and got off at the wrong wrong floor, and next minute I was met with this one throwing shapes, <laughs> <laughs> and then she could try these to me, and I said, "Take it easy, have a chill pill." You know what I mean? What's the problem? And I was just in the wrong floor, so I said, oh, "I'm on fives, so it's just six. No, no problem. I'll go down." You know, so they were you know, that was it. But I remember going to the Hard Rock. The Hard Rock Cafe was five minutes walk from the hotel, and we had to have a limo, and I and the limo took half an hour because everybody had to have a limo, and we shared it with them. Huey Lewis. Remember the Hugh, Louis Hughes in the news? Yeah. Absolute gentleman. Very nice guy he was. And and I said, well, why you know, can we not get out and walk? He says, no, it's not safe. Even though we were in what I think was called the stock program. It doesn't matter. You could get, you know, snatched or whatever. You know? So you had to be in the limo. And that was it. We did, he did, the, he was to close the show. So he did a numbers, a few numbers or whatever and uh, went down very well and uh, came back to the hotel. <clears throat> and the following day then, we were to fly home. And everything went fine. Just got home. I was a bit knackered because I had no sleep. For, I mean, we left on Thursday. I was back home on a Sunday. You know, the kind of thing. So, and he slept. I didn't. And he, uh, so I said, I thought that was it. And I left it. I came home. Went to my own lab. <clears throat> and a few days later, then I was got another call to say, would well, I be interested in looking after him? And so I went from there. We had um, some very good, got to know the guy. Hell of a nice guy. Um, some individuals associated them weren't exactly, you know, you wouldn't be calling them your friends or such, but that was it for another day. And uh, <clears throat> so I went to a number of trips with them. Probably the most notable would have been uh, Brazil for a couple of weeks in Brazil, Sao Paulo and Rio. And, uh, but uh, he did some very good shows there, did an extra show because he was he's very popular over there, believe it or not. The thing with Jerry is he has a unique sound. You could put half a dozen piano players up there, rock and roll piano players, all playing Jerry Lee tunes. And you, he could be in the middle and, he'd p- and you would pick him out. The rest of them are just, they're, they're basically copying. They're not unique. He is unique. The guy is self-taught. He learned the hard way. And um, his upbringing, you know, was tough. It's, they, were, they were poor dirt farmers in the, to a degree where they picked cotton, which is untold for, 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 for white people to do in, in the South. And his mother actually, <coughs> they sold the house, I think it was, for the because they were coming to, repl- to reclaim the, the piano he had. And she said, no, my son is born to play piano and take the house. And that's what they did. And they lived in whatever else after that. And when, when he got his first hit, I think he got his first big hits was Rick Balls of Fire and a whole lot of shaking, I think it was, in the f- mid-50s. And he, he went out and bought... Um, cars for everybody, Cadillacs. And the funny thing was he bought a car for his dad <coughs> and his his dad totaled it the first night. <laughs> and then he I went home, did outside his house. So he he actually rang up the dealer and he said, I want the exact car delivered now. And the guy was only too glad. Opened up the dealership, drove the car down. The next morning the father woke up sheepishly, thinking what's going to happen, looked outside and thought it was a bad dream. You know, never to the day he died did he tell him that he totaled the car and he bought him a new one. Like money it was unreal, you know. I mean, just it was just from nothing to having a crap load of money. So, they, they, like they, to give up your house for a piano, yeah, that but just goes to show how much is more right. new. He, he learned by listening to the African players, African American players underneath. He was in the table in these big easies, and the owner would say, "Jerry, go home. If they find you here, they'll burn me out." And he'd be under the seat listening to the guys. He'd be he could play rock and roll and boogie boogie on the same piano at the same time, one end to the other, you know. And most like. <laughs> I think of Jerry Lee, I think of like the madness, you know, the performer, um, the madness of him. And you said like, you just you just hit it off, but there was a few other people in the group that maybe 
We're there yeah. for Jerry's <coughs> yeah, well, Bob. Yeah, well, that was, was always right. You're talking about rock and roll. You're talking about madness. I mean, Jerry had a, a plane. It was one just, I think it was, I think it may be uh, Dakota, you know, the f- f- turbo prop jobs. And they remember, I remember a story I was told, and I believe it. They used to land in these two bit towns, and it'd be like a one street town. Mm. <laughs> they'd, the plane had landed, go tuck, 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 you know, trottle through the town. And they'd hop off it and go into a bar and have a few jars, thrash <laughs> the bar and leg it out and onto the plane and take off. I mean, that was a fact. And I remember he was going across the desert one time and he's looked down this truck, it was going faster. And he says, this is going faster than my plane. I want a jet. And he got, sold that, got himself a jet. And the, 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 I think he sold the plane to Buddy Holly. I knew what happened afterwards. Mm-hmm. Not too long later, he flew into a mountain. But they used to have mills. I mean, on the jet, he had a, a, I think, I don't know whether he owned it or leased it or whatever. He had a Lear jet and it was, he'd have a fight on it. And his, his lead guitarist is a guy called Kenny Lovelace. And now Jerry's, I think he's 85 this year or last year, 85. And Kenny Lovelace is 84. Cousins, first cousins. Again, uh, uh, Kenny, I think was an ex-Marine, but uh, he is his lead guitarist still to this day. And he'd be strumming away there, you know, and he, he plays rock and roll fiddle. Very, very great player, but he'd never, he won't have him jumping up and down stage. He's just there in that one position he's playing, you know, you wouldn't, you think he's in his front room. And I remember one, apparently one time he, Jerry was getting heavy with him or something like that. Like, and the man became a boot in the mouth and broke his nose. <clears throat> and if he ever got, if he ever gets a belt in the, the nose again, he'll lose his voice. Apparently it'll affect his septum or whatever, you know, whatever it does, it, you know. And so you have to, <laughs> don't hit Jerry in the nose if you have to. I just kept that in mind. I said, if he fucks with me, excuse the French. I, that's when I'm going to hit him first. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just, yeah, just, there were some stories. Really, but, but Brazil. It's, it's fascinating. Now, you, you were with him. Obviously, at that time, Jerry was, was in and out of Dublin quite regularly. Um, cause I, I think of memory says, right, he played the Olympia Theatre. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he played Which the Olympia Theatre. must have been some yeah. concert. Yeah, and he played, uh, then he did a thank you to, uh, for, um, his promoter here. He, he did a thank you for his promoter, um, I can't think of the guy's name, in Wexford Street. You know Wexford, um, what was the name of the place in Wexford Street? The Wexford Inn? The, no, it might be the Wexford Whelans. Inn. Yeah. Whelans, yeah, Whelans, yeah. And that was packed. But I tell you, I remember doing an impromptu, uh, impromptu in a pub out in, in Dunleary, near Dunleary, and it was, um, who's the guy that owns, he owns a pub, the Marion Inn, two brothers. Well, you couldn't get parking. The word went out. He only went in to play and started playing the piano. He was in for, a, you know, just a beer, in the piano, playing the piano. And the place was jammers. Like that, yeah, well, see, to see the rock yeah. and roll. Oh, yeah. the he's, 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 but he's just more like remember Bruce Springsteen saying, uh, "He's responsible. He was responsible for him and his music." You know, so a lot of he used to lay down the, you know, he, a lot of people who were were influenced by him, so you know, and self-taught individual. Now tell me, did you go to the deep south, Milton? Yeah, we, well, he lived in the he lived in uh, in, uh, in off the Malone Road in Desperate, Mississippi, and it was yeah, you could. You could see luxury and you could see absolute just devastation. You were talking about tin huts. You know, that, that's the difference, the difference in, 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 the, in the, the, the structure down there as such. But I remember, I remember I'll give you the laugh. It was one f- house <clears throat> he, he, we passed not far from him and he had these, you know, these big columns to have down the south. These houses, a big house. And he said, uh, see, that's the way it's different there. Different. He said, well, I was coming home one morning at eight o'clock and, and he was in a, in a, I can't think of a sports car of some sort. And he said, he came over Humpback Bridge and took off and landed in your man's <coughs> front room. Demolished the place, you know. <laughs> and he introduced me to the guy and he said, Do you remember that? Yeah, Jerry, you dropped in one morning for breakfast. Yeah, no problem. But, and I, he, he said to me, just send me the bill. <laughs> and he got out of the, out of the car and waddled off. He just down the road to his own ranch and into bed, you know. But he said, I fell asleep. He said, probably at the way and hit the, woke up at the wrong time. You know? <laughs> but it was, um. Was it a culture shock for you? To, yeah, because I tell you why, that and, and Brazil was a culture shock. How the poverty, just poverty. Jesus, we, we think we we have poverty here. Let's face it, but over there, we're talking with people in Brazil who didn't have clothes to wear, and they're called the night people. They just come out, and they're living literally in probably the sewers. You know, it's it was hard to you know, and I'm in a five star hotel, and we we were we'd come out in the morning, we'd go down for breakfast, and everything's laid there, and you just you know you just have a little bit to eat. You couldn't. You know, you just couldn't, you just couldn't eat what was there, you know, half the time. It was just too luxury. And I remember there was a guy outside the hotel and he used to sell juice and it was 50 cents for a litre of the best juice you could get. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd do it there and then, all the fruits. And we used to come out and I used to tell the guys, the band, 
because the, the band, uh, the group he had was Robbie Brennan, who's on drums, Irish guy, and Paul Ashford, who fortunately Paul, Paul has passed away. He was bass guitar. Then there was Kenny, Kenny Lovelace on his lead guitar. And then there was uh, another guy, I think it was, I can't remember his name. He was our sax player. He's a young guy. He was a brilliant sax player. He went to, I think he did stuff with Van Morrison and a few others after Jerry Lee, you know. But I used to say to the guys, look, they've got about a liter of set of, of the best juice, you, you know, all the, the Brazilian juices out of the rainforest near you. And I said, it's $5. Because we were on expenses, you know, five dollars. Yeah, I said, give them. And I said, I told you, man, cover up that five fifty cent job, will you? But they're going to, so your man, he, he nearly laid. He called the name his next ten kids out to me. <laughs> <laughs> he was crying when we were leaving. And we, every morning we come out, give him five dollars, and we five dollars each. So you can twenty twenty dollars, twenty five dollars a pop, you know, for for juice that he. Which was a lot to him. But you don't. He don't. Of course, it was. It was only he was getting ten times the price, you know. It's like buying selling fifty freaking yolks at fifty cents or something like that, you know. But he, uh, well, it was just the poverty was unreal. I mean, I was told by our, our, our we had an interpreter, a very nice girl called Malu Malu Kumo. She looked after as well, and she said, "Frank, don't wear those runners or those sneakers." And I think there was Nike at the time or something like that. We didn't think twice about them. Come on, I'll show, bring you down to markets. And she got you. But wear, wear the clothes they wear on the beach. Because she said, people are not bad, but those sneakers of yours is a meal for a week. Yeah. You know, and I said, you know, that's the thing. And you see hands coming out from the dark looking for something, you know. And you know, so you either had it or you didn't have it, you know. And then in bet- and people in between with that were just kind of striving to to, to do this. Because I was brought to the Fafellas, you know, they were the... Mm-hmm. And because I remember asking Malu, I said, Malu, I used to hear these boom, you know, booms going off. And I thought it was like something you'd hear in the, in the farm, you know, like... Sh- chasing off the birds, the crows. And she said, no, she said, that's just, believe it or not, she said, the dead squad's going in. And they, when it rains, they set off, it charges above the, the hills and the whole idea is to bury people. You know, that's it. She said, it's, see, they, it's, they don't arrest people as such. When they can't go, the fellas are run by, by the drug barons, you know. But the whole idea was, she said, to bury people. And I said, she, I said, yeah, she said, no, that won't get anything in your papers, she said. It might get that much, she said. And she did about, you know, half an inch in her, with her fingers, she said, "Because you'll only give out about what the weather and the, we're not burning our rainforest." He said, "It's big business that burns burns our rainforest, backed up by armies, backed up you know, by you know." So uh, it was a, it was a, it was, a, it was an eye opener, you know. Yeah, it certainly, certainly sounds it, and like there has to be like when we think of Jerry Lee, we think of madness. We you know all these stories of. Was he as mad as as he's made out to be? Well, <laughs> I only had one instance where you could say it was probably you know a bit off the off the cuff. So, but anyway, we were in Brazil. Time we were in Brazil, and we all, we all we're, like, he's gone to bed. And <clears throat> during the course of the night, maybe two in the morning, I hear the scream, and just look out the door. So he had a suite, and I had a suite right beside each other. In fact, you could have had one person. You know, everybody could have been in the one damn suite. You know, we didn't have to have one each. And I walked out and there's this one in the Blue Rinse Brigade, you know, running up and down the thing saying, mad, mad, mad man. And I'm looking around, here's Jerry. And he has a bandana with a feather in his, he has his ribs strapped with a freaking sheet. And he's there standing in his jocks and his cowboy boots. And he's got this bloody stick with a voodoo stick he obviously got from somebody, you know, when he's out and about, you know, as a gift. And he's standing there like that. And I said, jeez, Jerry, what's up? <laughs> Apparently he cracked his ribs. And I, 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 didn't, I thought he was having me on at the time and I said look I'll give you um, he wants you know Demerol or something like that and I said no Jerry you don't need that stuff I said it's paracetamol is the top thing now <laughs> so I gave him a couple of paracetamols but apparently the ribs are cracked anyway <clears throat> um, and of course the worst thing you do is, is put a sheet around to tie them because you know they don't knit and I went into the room and there's all these candles burning on the telly and on the f- furniture and then there's a few bits and pieces broken and lights and that and I said oh mother of God this is all we need you know <laughs> so I said I rang the promoters and get up here and he nearly, had, nearly wet himself and uh, I said look we've sorted this out don't worry about it so turn get rid of the candles get rid of the broken vase and all that kind of thing and of course the teddy had waxed run down the front of it <laughs> so chip it chip it away but we were going but this is, this is San Paulo yeah. this is Rio sorry so the following morning we were going back to San Paulo and because uh, they asked him to do another show otherwise we would have been flying back from Rio be out of the country so Got out, everything's okay, checked out. Yes, thank you for staying and all this stuff, you know. And uh, we got back to, I said, okay, we're out of here, right? It was only an hour, I think an hour's flight to, to back to Rio, out to San Paulo. And um, in the, right at the, at the airport, and uh, here's the cops waiting. Mr. Lewis, can we have your chat, you know? This guy there in his uniform. And I said, oh, Christ, here to go. Gives him, hands him a bill, hands him a scribble note, $3,000. 
And I said, what's that? He hands me, what's that? I said, um, for damages. Antique vase, uh, you know, cleaning, antique television. I said, well, the telly was antique. It was about 30 years old. I would agree with you. I said, but that's what the vase I said. It's only short of saying you could buy it in pennies. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so just paid him the money. You know, you don't argue. And there's dollars, not real. Real, as they call it, because it's worth nothing. You know, they like to be paid. And I said, can I have a receipt? I have no paper. I have no pen. <laughs> so, I, so I said, look, forget it. We get out of here, do the show. And the following day, then we flew to, to um, back home, you know. But it was, it, that was, you know, we had a few words um, that night when he wouldn't move. And I said, Jerry, look, there's three ways off this. Uh, this we're on the ninth floor, I said, Jerry. There's three ways out of this place. He says, the lift, you're not getting that. It's the stairs, you're not taking those. I said, the alternative is you better know how to fly. <laughs> and he said to me, and he said to me, he said, the last person to speak to me like that was my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. So no, we, no, we had him, um, we got on well. You know, we learned. I had scary moments with him. No, not really, no. Um, no, I can't say I did, you know. That, no. he, he never wanted to drive the car, no? Oh, no, he, yeah, well, there was one time he did, yeah, but that was, uh, he went in and he went in, we're going down to the studio and he, um, we were, a guy hops on the top of us and chops in through the thing, you know, with a machete. And he said, so we just got out of the place, you know. <laughs> I had to show how he showed me six shooter. But he said, the next time, Frank, I'll let you drive, you know. And, and, and the, the, I know I know that you've told me before that, you know, you would have to go to France to get your arms licenses. But well, the tra- yeah, I did. When I was going to do these things, um, it was necessary to, you know, maybe get the proper type of training as such in relation to one-on-one situations or in a team of three or four or whatever, you know. And I did stuff in, in um, Wales and uh, then we had to go to France for firearms training, you know. And, and fr- France for firearms training and such. Never had to use it. Uh, so you couldn't do, because I think it was after Dunblane, you couldn't do anything here or in England or such and such, such. I didn't. But I, I'm, not, I'm totally anti-gun anyway. And I said, I, I don't need to look after someone. They thought that was strange in the States. You know, I think, the, the, like most of the states, guys were all gung-ho. You know, they're either ex-army or ex-something or other or whatever, you know. And they're all used to, you know, battering people. And they, to, for someone to come and say, talk to someone and talk someone out of a situation, that was alien to them. You know, and that was the, that's the way we do it. And that's why they liked, you know, I, a guy said to me one time, he said, I like Irish guys, he said, because he said, they're not, um, he said, they're not gung-ho. He said, they're not headbangers. They can talk to you. And the last resort is, the last resort would be, you know, Sticking somebody, you know. But it was an education, you know, and uh, it was, um, uh, wouldn't rec- I wouldn't necessarily, I, I wouldn't have, I, I finished up in that two years, I, and it was probably the right time because days were 18 hours, some of them were 24 hours, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you could have gone, like, I'm lucky, I don't, I'd have an odd beer, it is, you know, I don't go on the tear and like that. Um, I never smoked, and, you know, I had, you know, a good diet. Had it work, worked out, kept myself right, you know. Yeah. And it, it all contributed to, the, to be able to do the job as such, you know. So, but it's, um, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody as such, you know. But it was something that was necessary at the time. I had bills to pay and uh, it was necessary, you know, had to do it. And I notice, I know you've looked after other people and yeah. there's some people that you, that you don't want to speak about because mm. you told me before we yeah. come on. But who, who, who else did you look after that you do want to speak about? Well, if you, if you, if you're talking about gentlemen, absolute gentlemen, I looked after, uh, Liam Neeson for the Michael Collins premieres for a week. There was another, a couple of us did it. There was Liam Neeson and his late wife, Natasha, a lovely guy. What you see is what you get. He's just down to earth. And uh, it was um, Neil Jordan was the same. And he was with his fiancée at the time, Brenda. And uh, there was Stephen Ray. Good guys. You know, just genuine guys. No, no demands. No nothing. Did what, you know, I, you told him to go. You're going here. No problem. That's fine. That's it. You know, I mean, there's no, but absolute, Liam Neeson was an absolute gentleman, you know, so and I'm glad to see he had, to, had the career he had, you know. Yeah, and if I take it away now from, from that, um, because I know you've recently retired and that, and there's one or two people that don't want to speak about which we won't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it back, Frank. Um, we spoke about the current Celtic team, and mm-hmm. I'll take it back. What, uh, you know, what early memories, or what, you know, what's your favourite memories over the year of Folly in the Tick? Number, I mean, ups and downs. I mean, I don't like you have to take it with, with the time I've I've supported them. Because you've seen some good times and some. So you have had some good times, some really good times, and you had some you know dark times. But you know that's all part of it. Nobody has the divine right to to win every time. You know, um, I think possibly 
any time you beat, you win against the blue half. Six two it stands out. You know, um Bull Vista. But like it's um I take each game and I take memories from each game. And it's always it's always discussion afterwards and it's always with like minded people. Whether it's yourself or whether it's Hilly when he calms down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that Hilly. <laughs> You know, and you, you meet people, you know, and the thing is, you know, I like it in the lounge in the Jockstein. It's people, you know, now no, you're not my age, but there's people there my age. I sit beside people who in the stands with Ricky and with Alan. And it was because Alan's, you got me the tickets for that. Remember you, you heard the son was, was given up his tickets and uh, you said you had someone. And that's how I got my, my ticket there, you know. But uh, they're, they're like-minded people, you know, just, um, and they, they celebrate like a 16 or an 18 year old. You know, so we haven't lost it yet. You know, so we're not sitting down, you know, with a quiet clap. They're up just as much as anybody else is if there's, a, if there's, a, if there's any injustice done on the pitch, you know. But no, it's, it's, I like where I am. Um, it's a good crowd. And, you know, we have a good laugh, you know. And you can debate it. We can all debate it with, um, with uh, you, know, for, you know, calmly as such, you know. So now, Frank, um, you're obviously getting back to Glasgow Mall now since you retired. Mm. You're also getting down to Spain. And you'll be back in Australia soon because it must yeah. be a wisdom to obviously your son. Yeah, see, I believe it's six years since he, I went over to, to, to Neil, believe it he's 46 now. Uh, for his 40, I kind of surprised me that I went over for about eight or nine days. And <clears throat> since then, then I had my two knees done. I had to because it was, I didn't want to go over pre-COVID until I got the, I got one de- knee done in 2019 and the other one was done during COVID in 2020 and uh, I didn't want to go before that because I was just felt it was a drag you know what I mean on him I couldn't do what I wanted to do pre- you know previously so now I've um, you know now the COVID's over I'm heading over for two months now in December and January back in February you know and Espana like yourself you know six weeks and next week for six weeks and then September, October, six weeks. So it's yeah. and then every two weeks, two weeks of every month in Glasgow. So you don't miss any matches, you know. So yeah, yep. Yeah. It's definitely. Uh, it was definitely the time to retire, Frank. Yeah, I should have done it. Should have done it beforehand. But look, I like it was doing what I was doing, and that was it. But uh, it's um, I do, I get value now from my my, my season books. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. So I mean, but I, it's only I, you know you're talking about um. I used to go over on my own I, when I went. Sorry, it was three of us went initially to North Stand, and then two of the lads when the downturn came, two of the lads, one went down back down to to, uh, to Bristol and it's Big John, Bino we call him, and um, then Neddy, who's a good friend of mine, he went to. In two thousand seven, he went. We went to a wedding in in Adelaide. And he met his pro- he, he met his uh, missus there, right? And in 2008, he got engaged. 2009, we were back for another wedding. And in 2010, he had his first kid. And he himself, myself and, and Bino used to travel together. And then I decided to keep them going. When they were away, I decided to keep the tickets going. And it was cost me, but at the time, about 1800, you know what I mean? So, and I didn't always have somebody to go with, you know? And it was uh, Vincent, as you know, said to me, why don't you join Margaret's? So, and he introduced me to Hilly, and uh, Hilly said, well, I can give you a price on this. And Hilly dropped the price down, I think, to about 1300 So I said, that's grand. And I still have two of those, and I have my own lounge ticket. But it was um, the best best move I made, to be honest with you. So there's a seat there for your son, if he comes home from Australia, and see for your grandchild. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd expect Hilly to make sure the lounge is available, after all. Gets enough value out of my one, so he did. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're listening, Hilly. I'm sure you are. Uh, or not to mention forgetting Shamey there, right, Shamey? <laughs> <laughs> Frank, but, uh, just before we wrap up, because yeah. it's been wonderful to get into your Celtic soul and get that, um, just get them Jerry Lee Lewis yeah, stories yeah. because so you know it fascinates me because I'm always yeah. Well, you're into music as well. I, you? I'm always yeah. kind of at you to for more details, yeah. and um, there's a few stories you, you couldn't share yeah, on the yeah. podcast that you shared with me privately. Um, so I'll have to wait for you to die now so I can share <laughs> yeah. them, you know what I mean? Um, not that I'm wishing you any, yeah. any bad luck, Frank. Yeah. But Frank, if you go back over those years, right, I asked, but you mentioned the 6-2, which is funny. Yeah. I asked Matt McClellan last week uh, what was his favourite Celtic Rangers memory and, and he, he he said that was the one. If you can go back and pick a player from over all those years of watching Celtic, who's who's the player that sticks out for you? Danny McGrain. A wonderful player. In my favourite. All-time player with Danny McGrain. Now, there's, look, that doesn't, uh, 
it devalue the rest of the players and such, you know. And but I, I've I've said Pickard, he was my favorite player. I always say Danny McRae, you know, what he'd be worth today. The guy, I know something. A couple of years ago, I remember at half time he was out and the players and he was chipping balls into the box. And if anybody watched him, everywhere the ball, it went onto a head. And that's where you put, you, like, players nowadays, not being able to put the ball in for a corner or to miss the first, or to get stuck, with the, not even get past the first man, that's, that's criminal. You know, you should, you practice and put it on. And I mean, if you put it in the penalty spot and the guy's coming in, he gets it, he gets above and you, you chance there you'll score. And he was just chipping him, like, boom, like as if it was just playtime, playtime. And that was out, you know, at half time. I remember it was a couple of years ago. But a, a, an absolute gentleman. Like you have Bertie, God, he's passed away. And like, let's face it, any of the, any of the, the, the team you met at any of the dues functions, they were always gave time to you. Yeah. That's one thing about it. You know, they, and also thankfully Celtic look after them, look after the lines and whatever. You know, they're there. And hopefully now those that are left will have another few years of this, you know? Oh, hopefully, yeah. And Danny's, yeah. Uh, Danny's uh, like, I interviewed Danny and I was kind of, I was going up to City North. It was the association that invited me up to interview their guests. And it was Jackie Mack, Paddy McCourt, Danny McGrain, I think Paul Bourne was there and there was someone else. Um, I forget who the, the, the person was, but um, Jackie was meant to be on last. Paddy McCourt was second. Uh, Paul Bourne was first and Danny was second. And they asked me, would they put Danny last? Because of his legendary status, mm. so I said okay. But when I went to call the two boys up, they were both missing. They were both in the bar, <laughs> gone to get a drink. So Danny came up. So when the two boys walked back in, Paddy and Jackie walked back in. Danny had the whole, he had the whole audience in his the palm of his hand, with his humour, and his his stories and the legacy that he carried on stage, and. When I called up, I think it was Paddy McCourt next, the two of them got up on the stage and they said, oh, we're good. we'll do this together because you can't follow Danny. <laughs> we were supposed to be on before him. And he did, he stole the show that night. He was absolutely brilliant. And what, what, a, what an honour it was for me to interview him as well. And he had great longevity at the club as well, didn't I he? I did, yeah. Fantastic guy, you yeah. know. Still, you know, then he had his coaching role and he's still about the park, yeah. like, you know. Yeah. Um, wonderful, one, wonderful, wonderful ambassador for himself. Ambassador. But, gee, but the guy was, you know... Just a phenomenal player. He was just like what he's like. I say, what we were today. He did everything the simple way. No, nothing fancy, whatever. He's just a solid fullback. He was, you know, same with Bertie, same with all the all the Lisbon Lions, and they were just see they played. They they were they they knew the history. They came from it, you know, and they grew. Some of them grew up in it, not all of them, but they soon learned it. And that's the thing about Celtic players coming. You know, I remember I, we might have disagreed on this finish when. When Rangers went down, we should have strengthened. But, you know, Rangers have gone down for a couple of years. And if we had bought players then, they would be gone by the time Rangers came back. They would have had their exposure. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always maintained. You know what I mean? You know, it's, um, it, it, you, uh, so I said, not everybody agrees with me, but I said, look, you know, look at the players now. We lost a spine. And on many occasions have we lost a spine of our team. And this time we had Ayer, who didn't want to be there. And we had Edward, who didn't want to be there. Christy had wanted to go, but he gave us 100%. Up to the time he, he did go, he was playing some of his best stuff under Ange. So, you know, you can't you can't just expect overnight to, to um, replace that. But Ange has done a wonder, and hopefully it'll be wrapped up by the shouting on Saturday. By, exactly, by the Saturday shouting on Saturday, in the story, you know. Frank, I thank you for driving down to the studio. Uh, we don't get many people in the studio because we're still doing a lot of yeah. stuff on Zoom, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to getting some more stories that maybe you couldn't talk about on here. On Saturday, on Saturday when, <laughs> when, when we get a wee natter before the game. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah. But thank you so much for letting us into your Celtic oh, well, I hope it wasn't too boring for, the, for, your, for your fans. Fans? No, listeners. No <laughs> fans listeners, here. Listeners, listeners. Your fanzine. Yeah, no, I was glad. Because it had been going on. We were talking about it and talking about it, you know. And I was just trying to think, you know, what would you ask me that I could answer and whatever, you know. But look, at the end of the day, without Celtic, I wouldn't have the quality of life I have. End of. The people I meet. And that's not, I'm not just saying that for the sake of saying it. It, it, it is what it is, you know? Yeah, Sadik is certainly more than 90, mi- more than 90 minutes, Frank. Yeah, off. But it's just, uh, and also I enjoy the, the fanzine. And so do the people I send it to. You know, so the... Well, the, Frank, yeah. we, we thank you for all the support. You've been very, you've been very good to us over the years, and especially during lockdown, even, even when things maybe weren't going well, 
you'd always pick the phone up and give us a call. So I much appreciate that. Oh, I enjoyed the read. You know, so I, I always keep a, I keep a spare one for down to Spain so I can bring it down, you know, give it over to, to McGill's, my favourite restaurant down there. You know, because her son is a Celt and he's in Perth. So he gets it sent out to him, you know, so he's delighted with it, you know. Brilliant, Frank. Folks, thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Frank Trundle for being my guest on the show today. Don't forget, folks, if you're uh, listening on, on your favourite podcast provider, just hit the subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything and you'll never miss an episode. And you can also listen to the podcast on Celtic Fanzine TV on YouTube. And if you want more information, you can visit CelticFanzine.com. But you can also pick up the fanzine, subscribe, donate for a price of a pint, or buy some of our merch. And we thank you for supporting more than 90 minutes, Celtic Fanzine, a podcast, and also everything you do for us, over, especially during lockdown, because without, without the listeners and without the readers, well, we wouldn't have survived during the lockdown. So thank you very much. Yeah.